the current situation if we move from a little from the past to what's happening now and what might be happening into the future was effectively triggered as a result of a report commissioned by government chief scientist sir john beddington around about 2010 and that was the future of food and farming it's a very important uh, report and it was very far thinking in terms of the developments that needed to take place. It just had one serious admission uh, and that was that it made no mention of any engineering inputs into uh, the future of agriculture and food. It was a point that we were very quick to point out to the chief scientist who was very responsive to this and said to the institution uh, will you please go away and write a report for my office and Parliament uh, in terms of the future of agricultural engineering and its role, the red document you can see there. That was complemented by uh, other inputs from the farming food community called Feeding the Future. All of those reports coming together, I think, has enabled new programmes to be laid out for research and development into the future. And this is under the Agri-Tech strategy. And there are four centres uh, that have now been established. Some of these are virtual centres already on existing university and, and other locations and are generally both industry and academic partnerships. And the two key ones are Crop and Soil Health and Protection, CHAPS, and the Agricultural Engineering Precision Innovation Centre, the Agri-Epi Centre. The, probably the latter one is the more significant as far as agricultural engineering is concerned. The Agriepi Centre has a number of partners, principally three academic centres, Cranford University, the Scottish Rural University Colleges and Harper Adams University, together with industrial partners. Now the slide here shows some of the recent developments at, at Cranfield. The, the slide to the upper right is a reworked soil tank facility that was transferred from the Silso campus to Cranfield. That now enables certain soil manipulation processes to take place in a, some blue canisters or modules in which crops can be grown and those crops and modules transferred to the giraffe style greenhouse we see there in the centre which has got programmable light intensities and crop monitoring facilities. So there's a lot of work going on within the Cranfield Centre there. Cranfield University was a recipient of the Queen's Anniversary Prize earlier this year for its work on large-scale soil and environmental data for the sustainable use of natural resources in the UK and worldwide. It was a tremendous accolade to Cranfield for all the work that had been happening over the recent decades in the subject. Professor Leon Terry was supportive of what had happened, uh, he himself being a former Silso boy. Moving from Cranfield and its partnership within the Agriepi Centre, Harper Adams University also received an award for recognition of the pioneering work into developing agricultural technologies and associated farming methods to deliver global food security. And here you can see the team at Buckingham Palace uh, having just received the award. And that was based on a number of projects, including the Hands Free Hectare, which was recognised earlier today with an innovation award and the long-term work supporting some of that started by Tim in controlled traffic in the tillage and traffic work that is going on there. The epicentre work at Harper is really a, a brave new front in terms of creating a sort of think tank inspirational unit, incubator unit, uh, and they have a large facility there to enable companies to come in uh, and undertake projects in collaboration with the university and, and other academic partners. The current time, there are two or three manufacturers working there. The first one to sign up was an Indian tractor manufacturer, TAFE, which is the third largest manufacturer of tractor units in the world. Others are uh, under discussion at the current time. And on the ground there, another institution, uh, Simon Thomas, who's the senior technical officer, uh, running what the activities there. Those people that have been uh, watching avidly the programmes at uh, 7 o'clock, the One Show on BBC One, may well have seen a couple of weeks ago the work of Simon Cooper, David White and Jim Loins at Harper Adams, 
all ex-SILSO students or SILSO alumni who've been working to improve the production of daffodils for agroceutical products. Those daffodils, if you grow them under stress in Welsh hillsides, produce more of the pharmaceutical that is required to help combat Alzheimer's. They've been using their own modified equipment and some equipment from Keith Rennie of uh, KRM, and Keith again is a Silso old boy. So we move though from the agri epicentres and the work at Cranfield and Harper to what's happening at rest. As we move from good picture of rest, we just think a little bit about the, the facilities on the ground. And what has happened there is that the majority of the house and gardens have been taken over by English Heritage and a significant investment has been made to restore the gardens back to the state they were in about 1835 and that has an impact from the work of Capability Brown. We will see there also a picture of Whitelaw Reed who was the US ambassador and he hired uh, Rest Park in the early part of the last century from about 1900 to 1910 as his country home while he was a US ambassador to the court of St. James. And he brought in people like Andrew Carnegie, the Vanderbilts, uh, Edward VII, all visited the house. And his very sort of positive American attitude to involving the village uh, saw him to be quite a favorite with, uh, with villagers at the time. But a lot of those grounds work and woodland work is undertaken by uh, volunteers. Uh, it's not all glamour, I can assure you, trying to build a polythene greenhouse using wire netting. Anyway, what, what else is happening here at Silso? Well, th I mentioned earlier the work on spraying. During the time of Silso Research Institute, they were, we were able to build up very significant and internationally competitive facilities, particularly in terms of a wind tunnel and also droplet sizing and field sampling strategies, that it would have been a, a tragedy, certainly in my view, to, look, to lose those. And I'm pleased to report that they now operate as a commercial company led by Claire Butler Ellis here on the site using the same laboratory facilities as was uh, the case when uh, Silso Research Institute and now operating very successfully as a, a commercial business. Also operating off the uh, Silso site is um, Tillett and Hague Technology building on the work that was done at the Institute looking at what was then termed plant scale husbandry and using computer vision in particular to, to start with to guide hose, uh, mechanical hose, down rows and now more significantly probably to identify plants within the row and to manipulate machinery, uh, both chemical and mechanical, around individual plants. And Tillett and Haig are actually on the Rest Park side, are actually tenants of English heritage. But also on the Silso site, there is a Solutions for Research, again a spin-out of the Institute, a commercial company now looking to provide mechanical and electronic services uh, in terms of those wanting to do uh, research and development. There's an ODA laboratory, again managed by ex-SRI people with Robert Sneath, who's built up and managed Silso ODAs, which is an ODA consultancy particularly directed at agricultural problems. The work that Tillett and Hagen done together with the spraying unit at Silso, I think comes together very nicely and very timely, uh, because I think in the last week or so, Garford Farm Machinery have just sold their first commercial spot sprayer, and that development is shown here, just as an example of the sort of work that was done, whereby it's using cameras on a tractor-mounted frame to, to guide both the frame and also to direct spray to individual plants, in this case, volunteer potatoes in an onion crop. Personally, very proud of the two top pictures. Uh, that's a carrot crop. Uh, on the left-hand side is a volunteer potato growing in the carrots before it was treated, and on the right-hand side, after it was treated by a machine that was travelling at five kilometres an hour and treating a swath that's two metres wide. And I think the impressive bit is, in the photograph on the right-hand side, is you can see that there's very little damage to the carrot, despite the fact that the volunteer potato has been treated with a total herbicide. So it's a, it's a measure of where the future is going, technology influencing large field machinery. Technology is also influencing the animal sector, 
and Toby Mottram, again X N I N C A E uh, and N I A E, set up a company ECAL where he's been looking primarily at bonuses for monitoring what's happening in the rumen of the cow, but is going on to develop other approaches of computerized herd management for milk production. Toby was appointed by the Douglas Bonford Trust to a chair in farm mechanisation and management at the Royal Agricultural University, where the Trust was keen to make sure that the concept of engineering was well represented at the RAU, and uh, Toby spent three years there making sure that we had uh, an engineering presence on the campus and that's now been taken over by Karen Rail Lovra, uh, shown in the picture on the upper right, together with Douglas Bonford trustees Peter Redman and Malcolm Crabtree. Toby then went back to his company, and Karen now is making sure that RAU has at least an engineering awareness. I think it's important to recognise that the institution is looking at ways of making sure that it can continue to punch above its weight. And one way in which it can do that is by its interactions with the Royal Academy of Engineering. And I think the present executive at the institution has been very successful in building very strong relationships with the Royal Academy of Engineering. It's making sure that we've got agricultural engineering well represented, both in terms of its fellowships, recognised here, but also in the way in which we work with the Royal Academy and I think it's going to be very interesting to see how we get on with our, our conference in November, which I think is a very good, prestigious uh, location in Carlton House Terrace, uh, hosted by the Royal Academy, and is a, a measure of increasing strengths between our institution and the way in which we can influence wider sphere of engineering.